Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to talk about TEAB, the Economics of Eastern Biodiversity. My name is Salman Hussain. I am based in the UNEP office in Geneva. I'll be talking about the Economics of Ecosystem Biodiversity, TEAB um, overall as a project, but also particularly on TEAB Phase 3 implementation. The TEAB initiative kicked off in 2008 at the G8 Plus 5 conference in Potsdam, um, and it very much was focused on trying to work out the cost of policy in action that would arise were we not to value our ecosystems and our biodiversity, and also the benefits of actions in that regard. So it's very similar in some respects to the stern review of climate change, which did, had a similar perspective for CO2 emissions and greenhouse gases. So the idea was to look um, in a stakeholder-focused way at what different parts of society could actually do to recognize, demonstrate, and then capture the values of ecosystem biodiversity. So a series of reports were targeted, for instance, at a team for business, team for national level decision makers, team for local decision makers, and TEAB overall had a significant impact on the international community. Going forward now to where we stand just now in the current phase of TEAB work, we, we're moving from the initial report writing to implementation, and TEAB phase three really has three components as we stand just now. Firstly, we have natural capital accounting, I'll describe the acronym in a second, CIEEA, which basically has a macro perspective, a cross-sectoral macro perspective. We then have some work which is basically a sector-specific assessment of agriculture and food systems. And finally, analyses which are country-level, so spatially explicit, so TEAB country studies. Start with then the macro level work, and apologies for the series of acronyms, I'll go over them. So UNEP team is working with the United Nations Statistics Division and the Secretariat of the Con Convention on Biological Diversity to implement something which is called CIEA, which stands for the System of Environmental Economic Accounting, Experimental Ecosystem Accounting. The key here is experimental accounting. This is very much leading edge. It's looking at ecosystems and ecosystem services and trying to map out first in biophysical terms what is the state in terms of land use, land cover, and secondly, what are the biophysical processes, ecosystem services and ecosystem processes which are providing the goods and services which benefit us in terms of our national economy. So clearly it's a very strong link up here with the United Statistics Division who have the mandate to look at this. And part of this Norway funded project, NORAD funded project, is developing a five year global strategy for implementing EEA guidelines and training material, communications and outreach material, but also critically country plans for seven pilot countries, where in, in each of these countries we've actually looked at the institutional capacity, the legal preparedness of the national statistics offices to actually implement this idea of experimental ecosystem accounting, first with biophysical assessment, then after that potentially with evaluation components as well. One of the outcomes arising from this element of the work is assessment of experimental biodiversity accounting. As I mentioned in the introduction, biodiversity doesn't function in the same way as climate change. There isn't a single metric in the sense of CO2 equivalence. Biodiversity becomes just a much more complex in nature. So what this technical guidance note provides is data mobilization process. It pro provides a synopsis of global data sets that we can use and also presents experimental biodiversity accounts. So this is, I think, very much leading edge work this is critical, critical for the sustainable development goals that the UN have just agreed and critical for development within countries. That's the first pillar of work. I'm now turning to the second pillar, which is T for Agriculture and Food. And what you have on this slide is a summary statement. So the TBAG Culture and Food Study is designed to provide a comprehensive economic evaluation of the eco-agri-food systems complex. I'm going to describe that in a minute. And demonstrate that the economic environment in which farmers operate is distorted by significant externalities that impacts on third parties, uncompensated impacts on third parties. These externalities may be both positive and negative, and teabag and food recognize a lack of awareness of dependency on natural capital. What then is the eco-agri-food systems complex? So we typically think of agriculture and food systems, as you see from this diagram here. We then know that there's very visible outputs we were very aware of, such as from the employment, food and fiber, um, and potentially if it's visible agrotourism. We also think, if we think about agricultural economics, about human interventions to that system. Say, for instance, the extent to which we apply and how we use irrigation, fertilizers, pesticides, or perhaps biotechnology.
We also know in economic terms there are the factors of production, like labour and machinery. We also know there are things like breeding which are important in terms of developing yield outcomes. These are all very visible. This is an area of work which is very well documented and has a huge literature. We also, though, can think of the invisible costs, which are much less well-researched, such as health impacts, for rise from agriculture systems to human impacts. And we can think of um, pollution to air and water, and explicitly in greenhouse gas emissions. Where T really comes to the fore is this bottom element, biodiverse and ecosystems. So whereas in phase one we talked about this more generically, now we're looking at agriculture and ecosystems and their respective impacts with biodiverse and ecosystem services. These services, the benefits which are often invisible, include things like genetic variability, the moderation of extreme events, um, pest control, etc. And our argument is that by making these other hitherto invisible ecosystem services visible, we will change the discourse, we'll change the understanding of what a sustainable agricultural food system looks like, and indeed the best the benefits that are derived from that system. We also know there are downsides in terms of agriculture providing disutilities, disbenefits to biodiverse and ecosystem services. For instance, habitat encroachment and species reduction and soil erosion. So this is the framework we're applying. This diagram looks within the farm gate. Teabag and food in terms of the complex goes beyond farm gate, looks at distribution, production, final consumption and waste disposal. What have, we, what have we done so far? Well, we commissioned some feeder studies. You'll see that across this map globally where the feeder studies are located in terms of case studies. I'm going to focus in just now just on rice. And you'll see we have, and we explicitly requested this and required this, a real heterogeneity in terms of the systems we're looking at. There's heterogeneity both in terms of the ecological diversity of these systems, but also socioeconomic and cultural diversity. So the rice is produced in many, many different ways in different locations. And here's a snapshot of some of those production systems. Why focus on rice? Well, worldwide, about 80 million hectares of irrigated lowland rice provides 75% of the world's rice production. This predominant type of rice system receives about 40% of the world's total irrigation water. That's a startling statistic, 40% of the world's total irrigation water and 30% of the world's developed freshwater resources. Now, clearly, we know that freshwater availability is an extremely important constraint development, and therefore looking at rice production, I think, can be very beneficial. We looked at many different types of management interventions. We did a kind of um, binomial assessment of um, management intervention A versus B. We grouped some of these into something called a system of rice intensification. And this is SRI basically involves transplanting young single rice seedlings with care and spacing. In addition, the use of a mechanically rotary hoe or weeder to aerate the soil. This is discussed in our reports, but just to give you a kind of headline outcome. Well, we have a situation here where we look at three countries. Two of them are rain-fed systems, so there's no water consumption costs. But we have a system in each, each of these cases where applying SRI increases yields. And that means increases in livelihood impacts for rural communities. We also see a win-win outcome, because not only in Senegal do we increase yields and therefore benefits, but we also decrease the cost associated with water consumption. To summarise then for Senegal, society would save around 11 million, according to our first cost estimate, in water consumption related to health and environmental costs, and at the same time, the rice producing community would gain a total of 17 million through increasing yields. A clear synergy. We also have TEEP country studies. As you just saw, there are studies within countries focused on a particular sector, but the TEEP country study is more generic in nature. I focused here on two studies that are basically agriculturally focused. So in Tanzania, we went in, we asked the vice president's office to convene stakeholders, and we decided through that process to focus on an area of the country called the Rafiji Basin, which is about 20% of the country, and look very much at a policy intervention which um, uh, the Tanzanian government are currently focusing on, which is called Big Results Now. Big Results Now is very much trying to increase agricultural productivity and yields and stability of income for rural communities by considering ecosystem services. So this was ideal for us. And it's very complex because we have in the Rufiji Basin three different types of biomes. We have the highland regions, which are mountainous grasslands, that are being converted to, to trees for timber. In the midlands, we have a scenario analysis that we're carrying out to examine the impacts of community-based land use planning on livestock management. So livestock management, in turn, will actually have an impact overall on hydrological services.
A link to that in the lowlands, the mangrove ecosystems are under threat from deforestation, upstream water use, both of which affects water availability and quality. And mangroves, we know, also provide other ecosystem services like disaster risk mitigation. So the Tanzanian study is ongoing. It's being led by the University of Dar es Salaam. We're getting onto valuation components in the second quarter of 2016. Turning finally to Ecuador. So in Ecuador, another agricultural example, just by chance, so in the Guayas watershed, TIB examines the impact of different growth scenarios, focusing on what the Ecuadorian government have tried to look at, their prioritization of the change of productive matrix. And the change of productive matrix is looking at the shift in agricultural systems towards a particular subset of commodities. And we're looking at a case study of cacao, which is one of these commodities. Secondly, in Ecuador, a completely separate study on the coca watershed, which is more focused on hydro. And TIB is analysing the change in ecosystem service provisioning and the various scenarios of incentive programmes for ecosystem restoration, conservation, sustainable use. So you see here at the bottom of the slide, Socio Bosque, which is a programme to try to conserve forests. And the idea here is what are the benefits and the co-benefits in terms of ecosystem services of conserving forests? How does that impact on hydro and hydro production? So in some respects, very similar to the T-Bhutan study, um, but will provide inputs which will say that we ought to be conserving potentially forests, not for their own sake, maybe that's re that's also relevant, but conserving the forest because they provide benefits in terms of livelihood impacts. We picked Ecuador because basically Ecuador is, is somewhat different in terms of countries compared to the other team country studies because there is a different perception and standing, I would say, of nature within the constitution. So the, the people's concept of good living exists in which individuals within the social and cultural communities pollute pursue collective development with respect to diversity and harmonious coexistence with nature. We have a diversity of studies. As I've just summarized in this quick slideshow, three main peer, uh, pillars of work, a lot going on in TEAP. I do hope you'll get back in touch and contact me at the TEAP office or my colleagues, and I'm happy to take questions and uh, receive inputs from you. Thank you very much for your time.